Good evening. You're continuing kind of to 101.9 Chai FM. My name is Liron Mazor. This is the Personal Finance Hour. I'm looking forward to being with you on the journey this evening, a very different type of show. Tonight, I thought we'd go a bit of an entrepreneurial, a bit of the business type of angle. And the reason I want to go that avenue is because I also want to try and understand it. How does it all fit in with personal finance? So my guests are looking at me and thinking, geez, that's an angle we didn't even see coming. But don't worry, I'll show you how it all ties together. And uh, it's going to be very different, very creative. In me with the student studio is Gil Oved, <coughs> and co-founder and, and joint CEO, Ran Noina, and they're at the home of South Africa's biggest activations agency <coughs> with basically a turnover of 500 million rand, which is really, <coughs> excuse me, a, a, a huge accomplishment. So now I'm looking and thinking, geez, that's some nice turnover. But with everything, we've got to ask about cash flow. So turnover is great. If there's no cash flow, there ain't much of a business. And really what, we, what I want to try and get an understanding tonight is part of your journey, <clears throat> what got you to where you are tonight, part of the struggles, and also what is your secret to creating wealth? Because I think everyone's got to have some sort of secret or idea, and uh, that's quite exciting and always important to look at. We're going to cover all of that during the show. Gil, I know you're a fan of American uh, politics, I'm also, so I, I, I'm going to be an interesting when we come back. We'll just have a very quick question on your view on where we're going in American politics, and then let's understand your story to wealth creation. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. If you've just tuned in, I'm speaking with Gil Oved, co-founder and joint CEO, and uh, his partner, Ran Noina, and they're basically at South Africa, the home of South Africa's biggest activ activations company, a company with 500 million turnover. We're going to get a bit of an understanding about that, but I think tonight really is a story what I've always wanted to do is my entrepreneurial section. And what I like to do is bring entrepreneurs in or people that have been successful and try and understand what's their secret to creating wealth. I think that many people have got different secrets. I like to break them down to formulas. And the reason I like a formula is because it gives us a fundamental, a measuring point. When we can turn around and say, great, the secret to creating wealth is hard work and perseverance. And hard work and perseverance is defined as putting in 60 to 100 hours working hours per week. We can always measure ourselves to say, how are we doing? It doesn't mean we're being effective. It means we're putting in the hours. How effective are we during those hours? Are we putting in the hours, but we're so exhausted that we actually can't think straight? that sometimes we're just numbing our way through. We're going to be discussing that. Uh, I think, Gil, we did mention that we'd be discussing American, American politics, but I'm going to leave that more towards the end. Uh, we'll end off with that. We can take a bit of a bet. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at you and thinking that you're a bit of a Republican. I don't know how accurate that is. I gave it away. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate. I'm a bit of a Democrat, so it will be an interesting discussion, but that will be towards the end of the show. So, Gil, I'm going to maybe start with you just because I brought you in from the politics. Just give us an idea. What exactly is your company? Uh, do you know, it, it sounds quite an, a fancy term, an activations agency. Yeah. So, so what exactly is that? So, firstly, uh, good evening to you, Liron. Good evening. And to the listeners. And um, so, the company is called the Creative Council Group. And Great. to keep it simple, it's a sales and marketing, uh, full value chain solutions company. And we do work for a whole lot of big multinational companies, promotional and marketing work. We do it for Vodacom, Unilever, Colgate, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, all the big companies. And we offer them a wide variety of solutions from field marketing to merchandising, promotions, um, advertising, creative, strategy. So it's, it's quite broad. Okay, good. Give me a practical example so I can understand. I'll give it, I'll give it to you in a, in a nutshell version. You walk into a pick and pay yes. and a promoter stands there and offers you a soap sample right. or a taste of a yogurt. Right. 65 percent of the time that's one of our goals okay how do you how do you end up getting into that because that's quite a big uh, i mean that's quite an interesting concept i mean i've seen them and it must be a phenomenal business i can understand why turnover now 500 million is possible and it's only been 11 years which is unbelievable which is a huge accomplishment but but how do you get into that how do you start so i think i'll take this one um about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, Gil and I had a business that went, uh, literally went bang in the dot-com bubble. Okay. And we were left with nothing. We were left with no confidence and with nothing to do. And I had a girlfriend who was doing promotions. Right. So I went to visit her in the store one day. Just uh, thought I'd go in, call in and say, how's it? And uh, when I arrived there, I saw that there were 65 of these girls. Right. All of them which weren't doing a great job in terms of return on investment. Okay. And I'm an ex-banker. I like things in spreadsheets. I like right. to do return on investment. And I figured, well, let's... Give, it, give this business a bash, and the next thing we knew, we, were, we started a promotions business. The, the irony, though, is that I think when we, started, when we started it, we kind of felt that we needed to make a little bit of money to pay for the petrol, 
to get to the office to right. decide what we're really going to do with our lives. Right. Our and that was 11 years ago. Right. In our best case scenario, this business was supposed to turn over 3 million rand a year. And right. we said if we get to 3 million, we're done, we're dusted, and we're going to move on to bigger, better things. Right. This is, this is what I love, and this is where it's going to be quite interesting, because people are thinking, geez, this is personal finance. What has this got to do with personal finance? So you both got a qualification. I think, Kelly, if I'm not wrong, you've got the CFA? We both have CFAs. Great. So you've got both got CFA. So what is a CFA for the listener that's not familiar with it? It's really a qualification that you'd study if you want to become a fund manager. Well, yes, yes. It teaches you about risk and returns. Um, we both did our CFAs when the stock markets are running, and we thought that the future of, uh, of making money was in stockbroking and merchant banking, and so you had to go and get yourself degreed for that. Right. I think it's, it's – if you want to run a business – uh, we, I did a, a BCom in marketing, actually, as an undergrad. Right. And my passion was always in marketing, actually. Okay. But I felt that if I wanted to run a business and be credible, I needed to be, to be comfortable with finances. Okay. And the CFA kind of offered that. Why but not, it was quite niche. Yes, but why not just do, a, do, a, do an MBA? Because, firstly, uh, I'm not mad about MBAs in South Africa. Okay. I think the major purpose of an MBA is really to network with the right people. So you need to be doing that overseas. You need to be doing that full-time. And CFA was a good solution. It was correspondence. It was inexpensive. Um, I could do it whilst starting the business, which is what we did. Uh, it's international. It's a skill. It's a specific skill. So it kind of answered a lot of those needs. I also think for an MBA, you need to, get, you need to have real experience before you go out and study an MBA. I see a lot of guys that are studying MBAs don't have the practical experience on the ground. And I wish that they could see what we've been through in the last 10 years in terms of what you don't learn in the book and what you actually got to, you got to live. In fact, we kind of always joke about, and no disrespect to MBAs because there's huge value there, but we often joke about it in the sense that there's charts and graphs but no practical experience, which we think is way more important. If you've just tuned in, I'm speaking with Gil Oved and his uh, joint CEO, Ran Noina, and they're part of the Creative Council Group. Really what they do is an activations agency an example would be if you walk into pick and pay and you see some beautiful girl selling soap and you think, geez, I have to buy the soap, not because she's beautiful, but because it's a great soap. That's really their business. They're turning over 500 million at the moment. I think it's great that you guys can share that. And what we've just been discussing is to try and get an understanding of the backgrounds. And both Gil and uh, Ran have both studied a CFA, which is very much within my industry as the financial planning fund manager industry is a very well-known qualification. And I suppose that's given you a great foundation because you really understand the art of wealth. So let me ask you this personal question. You don't have to answer it. You can be as detailed or undetailed as you want to. I will be as open for you for any questions that you want to throw back at me. In terms of personal wealth, how have you created your own personal wealth? <laughs> we were actually hoping before the show that this question wouldn't come up because we spend so much time in the business that I think our personal wealth does take a bit of a backseat. Um, we ma we married to a business. We've Great. been working hard in a business. So. Great. I w I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to teach you one or two things, which maybe will be nice for you because of lessons that I learned. Gil, you comfortable with the answer that Rand gave? Yeah. Worse than his. Okay. No problem. If you've got any questions and you want to be part of this conversation, we'd love to hear from you. The number to call me on is 0861 2434 If you've got any questions for either, either Run or for Gil, please send us an SMS. The number is 34519. We will be discussing politics towards the end. It's just a, a nice thing, uh, especially that we are in elections. And, uh, you know, I love having everybody being part of the show. The questions aren't my questions alone. And uh, I definitely like to be engaging and understanding where everything comes from. So let me give you an important lesson, because why I want to discuss it from a personal finance point of view is that there's many ways to creating wealth. One of the best ways to probably really boost yourself is to get into a business. The problem with being in a business is it's got its own challenges. And often what I've repeated on the show, and we discussed it last week as well, is if ever I was looking for a formula for creating wealth, there was a great book which I read called The Richest Man in Babylon. And I had nothing but debt, three qualifications, all in finance, BCom Honors, all in finance, and a CFP. So it's all financial planning and finance. So I, didn't decide not, I decided not to go the CFA route, uh, just because I felt geez, at that stage it was just too much, and I thought you know, it's enough qualifications for the time being. It, it's something I'll probably look at doing in the future. But within this book, a practical book, the formula goes as follows. 10% of what you earn goes to savings. 10% goes to debt. Sorry, 10% goes to charity. 20% to debt. 60% you live off. I'm going to keep repeating this over and over again because what's quite interesting is last week when, when I was on the show with the, 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 the gentleman that created this through the Chev, it's a brilliant course that they do. It's an hour's course to teach people the practicalities of really what, what, what's behind creating wealth. 
what we what I said is the biggest issue which most people have is that they're just lazy. So most people are just too lazy to say, I'll deal with it another time. I've got too many things on my mind. It's just not going to happen at the moment. I'm going to be turning around and changing the word from a, a from Morris, which was uh, a friend of mine that gave it to me on Shabbat. Uh, bumped into me, started talking to me about it. And he said to me, Geez, you know, why don't you rather make it about responsibility, which I think is a much better word. Do you know how much of us are prepared to take responsibility for creating wealth? So stay tuned. We're going to come back to that. One or more two tips, and then we're going to understand what is it about passion that drives a business and how important is turnover versus cash flow. Stay tuned, we'll be right back after this. The best talk, the best music, the best radio. Serving your community. With the best. Of the best. By a best. 101.9 megahertz of power. From Johannesburg to Istanbul daily, and from Istanbul to Israel 35 times a week. Whether you want to make a quick connection or spend a day shopping in Istanbul, Turkish Airlines offers the most convenient travel route to Israel. We are Turkish Airlines. We are globally yours. Oh, and did we mention we have a flying chef? This, 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 is 101.9 Chai FM, 101.9 megahertz of power. This is Personal Finance with Liron Mazor on 101.9 Chai FM. This evening I'm speaking with Gil Oved and Ran Noina from the Creative Council Group. They run a company, well, they run the biggest activations agency within South Africa. And uh, for anyone that's not familiar with what an activations company is, I've used the example of a lady that's in pick and pay that was given to me by Gil that uh, basically sells soap and that you go through and you'd buy the soap or should give the voucher to you. If there's anybody that would like to phone through, we'd love to hear from you. The number to SMS, me, sorry, the number to call me on is 0861242436. Um, I'd love you to ask any questions to our listeners. It could be something of value. Before we left off, I just said, you know, it's quite interesting is that many entrepreneurs, including myself, being in a business, we sometimes forget the basics and the most essential thing, and that's creating wealth. I gave the formula which for creating wealth, which was put 10, 10% aside to savings, 10% to charity, 20% to debt, 60% you live off. The 10% that's going to savings should increase at a further 10% every quarter until you get between 30 to 50% of your income saved. That's just a starting point. Most people say to me they can't do it. Everyone will tell me they cannot do it. The funny thing is I said the same thing. And you actually can do it. The first 12 months are completely horrendous, and there will be times that you sometimes dip into it. But without a doubt, you can do it. And what I find is so important about this is discipline. And I suppose that really brings us back to your business. We're going to come back to understand turnover versus cash flow just now. But maybe tell me, what, what in your opinion do you think is so important? Because one of the means of creating wealth is opening up your own business. What do you believe is the fundamentals? Gil, I'm going to give you a chance to give me your top three fundamentals. And then, uh, Ron, I'm going to give you your chance, and I want to hear, Gil, as part of it, passion. Yeah, okay, so I, I think um, we've never really, neither Ron nor I, have actually focused sufficiently on our personal finances okay. because we gave birth to a baby who needed a lot of nurturing. Being your business, in case Being, people misunderstand yes. that you are single, yes. <laughs> and you're both very, very good-looking gentlemen. Not that I'm that way inclined, but I'm just saying out there, if there's any women that are looking for two young, uh, honorable gentlemen... I think that uh, this would be a good starting point. <laughs> Thank you, Liron, and your check is in the post. Um, but, um, yeah, we've never really given it much focus in our personal finances, but creating wealth has always been important to us, and we always recognize the importance of, of the difference between equity and uh, normal salaries and the like. Okay. And there is, there is nothing to compare uh, to the importance of equity and what we've w kind of our early vision was that any part of the value chain that we could uh, take take ownership of right um, and almost create a micro economy in what we do would help create that wealth so I think even though on a personal level we haven't really focused on it yes. from a business perspective yes. but next week's a new week for well, you and you'll as of tonight next. actually Liron I mean I've been writing down notes Good. according to Good. what you've been telling me Good. but uh, yeah I think creating wealth is critical and starting a business is one option you asked about passion um, we've got this view that you could make up for a lot of inconsistencies a lot of flaws in your understanding of the business that you start if you have passion, okay. um, there's a term I use, uh, passion-fueled optimism. Right. Um, and it's almost like 
having a view that isn't necessarily realistic. It's an optimistic view. It's not a realistic view of what the future should be like um, in the business that you want to create. And that passion allows other people, suppliers, uh, clients, to be attracted to it, even if they recognize that you may not have the skills, they know that you'll make up for it with passion. Passion for their brands, passion for what they want to do with their lives. There's, I'm just trying to see that there was notes in that I was being given, which are very good, very, very comprehensive notes. And one of the things that, that really got me excited about it was how that she said to me it was important that you look after your clients, or your, 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 I'm just trying to find the exact wording, that uh, your, your, your customers and the, the clients really felt that the, the, there was a very exciting offering and something that was different and unique. So in terms of engaging with them, what I liked about that is I thought, geez, you know, that would be quite nice to bring into my business. How, how important do you think that is within any business? So I think, I think it is. It's very, very important. We t- if, you, if you look at our industry, our industry is quite com- or was quite commoditized. Right. And all we actually brought into the business was a new take on things, a new passion on things. I mean, Gil used his term. My, 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 I reckon that our business is actually powered by passion. And when you walk into our offices, you feel, you feel like you're in, a, you're in a boiler room. So, yes, I think that passion comes from the leaders. I often find that when I have a tired day or a tired week that the whole business slows down. So as a leader, you've really, really got to empower passion in your teams and you've got to put in certain stops in place to make sure that you know when the passion levels are dying and you reignite them very, very quickly. And clients pick that up. Suppliers pick that up. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned about uh, clients. Uh, we, we love the brands that we work, work on. Sometimes I fear we love it more than our own clients do because I think they see it as a career. But for us, we recognize that success of these brands means success of our business, of our joint child, uh, figuratively speaking. Great. The, Ran, there's an interesting point that you brought up. Because we're talking about it from a personal finance point of view, it's important that the listener understands that these ideas within a business. I know that there's the Orchard Business Show, which also gives great fundamentals. I think that they apply to no matter where you are, what's going on in your life. So I always turn around and say for a family, view your, com- view your family as your business. And there's a very simple question. Is your business, your personal business, because you've got two businesses, you've got your business that you're really married to, and then you've got your personal business, which you seem to be a bit divorced from. So, so is the rest of the world, so don't feel bad. The question is, as a family, are you making a profit or are you making a loss? It's a very simple question. Profit or loss? And if you're making a loss, great. Well, how do you now fix up your family business? That's your legacy. That's your real legacy. And the only way to do that is to follow fundamentals and to follow savings. But a very important point, Ryan, which you made just now, which, is, which, which I wrote down, is when you get tired, you feel the business gets tired. And it's quite amazing because I recognize that myself. And what's so important in terms of wealth creation is that you, sometimes you need to actually realize that you need to take time off. If you don't take time off to re-energize yourself, you know, everything else suffers along that. We spoke about working these 100-hour weeks, which I sometimes figure out how the hell do these people do 100 hours. Like, I'm pushing 60, maybe 70. How do they get, get 100 in? And I can understand if they do, but, I mean, after three or four months of running at that pace, I'm tired, and my business stops. It doesn't stop completely, but I actually feel that it's slowed down. And, and, and what's quite important is, within your personal capacity, you could sometimes find that in your, in your family. That the family, because your family is your business, it's your business unit. Why it's so important for personal finance? Because it all boils down to the same thing, one simple word, cash flow. Do you have a positive or a negative cash flow? I also want to know your opinion. My number to SMS me on is 0861242436, or SM, sorry, the number to call me on was 0861242436, or send me an SMS to 34519. I want to hear from you. I want to know what your feelings and your thoughts are. Run. So I think a lot of big words there, you talk about family, you talk about holidays or winding down or taking time off. So for the first probably five, six years of the business, the worst thing you could do was send us on holiday. Right. And the worst thing is that we were best friends, so we used to go on holiday together. So <laughs> you can imagine how much holiday we used to have. Yes. Um, we found ourselves emailing three or four days into the holiday just to keep up the, the, yes. the, the hamster wheel turning. Yes. And I think as time moved on, we, we, we delegated that to the management team. Not, right. I mean, that's not to say that we don't send each other mails and BBMs at 2 a.m. and saying, let's get this done or let's get that done. Right. But as an entrepreneur, you're investing in your business. Right. Um, and you're investing it at, at, a, at a cost to your personal life. Right. I can't tell you how many girlfriends have, uh, have, have told me off because I don't have time for them or because I wasted time on holidays when I shouldn't have been working, I was working. But that's the investment that we made, and now we're reaping the rewards. Right. Um, you talk about cash flow versus uh, turnover. Versus, versus turnover. We're a cash generative business. We don't have we don't, don't we don't have a high asset base. We've invested all our investing is done. We've got our infrastructure around the country. So basically, we we have a margin. And that margin is pure cash flow that's fun, that's funded by the book. So from that point of view, we're quite a healthy business. 
Um, and I think we're lucky that we're not an asset-heavy heavy business. Can I throw another challenge out at you? Yeah. In terms of company reserves, what are your company reserves looking at? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I th- look, we have cash reserves. We have significant cash reserves. Great. We're looking at them because we're going to be qu- – we are quite acquisitive. We're looking for very strategic investments. Great. Um, we haven't drawn very much from the business. We've Great. been – like we've always tried to, like we said, keep it in the business. Right. We've got a long-term view of what we do right. and how we want to do it. We want to grow. We feel very aggressive. We're ambitious. Um, some people would argue, uh, you, you mentioned you know, 11 years, such a short space of time, 500 million, whatever it is, doesn't matter. The, the, the main point for us is the way we see our business is it's a seed that we've just planted. Right. And it's just showing the first shoots. Right. And... You know, people walk into our offices and they see a few hundred people walking. There's a lot of energy and dynamicism, and they, they're impressed, and we're not at all. We're frustrated. Yes. We sit back and we're like, my goodness, it could have been so much bigger, so much better. Yes. We've made so many mistakes. We're very yes. critical of each other, yes. of ourselves. Yes. So, you know, in fact, I had a conversation uh, this morning with one of my friends, and he said, you know, we were talking about this year, and I said to him, it's a tough year, and the next year we want to do better. And he said, yeah, you know, your, your other shareholders must be putting pressure on you. And my response was, uh, they don't need to. <laughs> they couldn't possibly put more pressure on us than we have already on ourselves. Yes, I know the feeling because the worst boss is yourself. Yeah. I'm not stressed that we have been quite prudent though in terms of our personal finances. Yeah. We've uh, we've t- we know that you can't put all your eggs in one basket and you can't live. You've got to live a diversified lifestyle. So you can't have everything invested in the business. And we've been quite prudent in that we've established or we've taken. You know, you talk about a 10% savings or a 20% savings. We haven't drawn it uh, through a formula, but we have taken money out of the business in the past to make sure that we have enough to be diversified in case something can happen to a right. business. And we we recognise that businesses, even successful ones that are diversified and look stable, uh, anything can happen. Enron went down. Anything can happen. Correct. We want to be we want to be secure and we want to be comfortable long term. Someone once told me that any business is three months away from liquidation. Correct. And at the time, I looked at this and said, "Are you crazy? Three months?" And as you realise how big your expense base grows and how big your infrastructure base grows, you actually realise that, hang on, if something happens in three yes. months, this could be a thing of the past. Yes. So yeah. we, We've seen that, and we, again, we're both CFAs, so we understand risk return, and we understand the idea of diversifying and taking stuff out of your, your cash cow or your business. Um, and you, I think, like I say, we've been quite prudent. Brilliant. We've also kind of always borne in mind that I think a lot of young entrepreneurs who start young businesses, they initially make super profits uh, because of the entrepreneurial flair, and then as things normalize and profits normalize and margins normalize, what they don't realize is if you're working on just for argument's sake, a 25% margin, just for argument's sake. Uh, if your revenues drop by 25%, your profits don't drop by 25%. Yes. They go to zero. A lot, of, a lot of young entrepreneurs don't realize it. It can happen so quickly. Yes. If you've just tuned in, I'm speaking with Gil Oved and Ran Noina, uh, the, both joint CEOs, of, joint CEOs of the Creative Council Group. Really what they do is they focus on activations agency it's been a very good uh, conversation, I think very high-paced. And really what we're speaking about tonight is trying to understand from a personal perspective what is going on in terms of creating long-term wealth and then at the same time, how do, how, what, what really helps you in terms of understanding what drives your business. And why we're looking at it from a personal finance point of view is because I want to understand it from two angles. I want to understand if I'm looking at creating more wealth, one of the best ways for me to do that would be to opening a business. And I also understand it from a personal perspective is what really drives you in terms of creating wealth for yourself because that's really ultimately what you're doing this for. You're saying how to create more wealth. You've spoken, we just spoke about just now, it was a very interesting point to say where basically any business is three months away before liquidation. You said you've got reserves, which is brilliant. Uh, I know that the, it's a very high pace because you both have got so much to share and there's a lot for us to still go through. So we're going to carry on with that. But before we do, we've got an SMS that's come through and it's running Gill. What fire drives your personal passion? <laughs> we tend to look at each other. I don't know who wants to go, go for it. No, it's all just. So um, it's actually interesting. It's a good question because it's changed over time. Right. Um, when we started, when we started the business, uh, we were in our mid twenties. We had a lot to prove to okay. ourselves, to everyone else. Uh, we had just come out of a three-year business that had failed. Okay. It was hard. We we were wondering why. We were punished so badly, little did we know that it was the best learning one could ever have. And I, 
I'd strongly recommend to any entrepreneurs to try and mess up their initial business so that they can learn for the second business because I can tell you now if we didn't have those lessons we wouldn't be here today we would we learned on a small scale so that we don't make the mistakes on a big scale but in our mid-20s when we started the business we had a lot to prove we had no money so one of the things was just ensuring that we could survive and and start the business and it was all about ego as you as the business gets uh, bigger and you start employing people and you realize that you've got responsibilities and you're accountable to their livelihoods and their families, it becomes more about legacy. It becomes about making a difference. I'm, I'm, I always worry about saying these things because it sounds kind of cheesy and some people may think it's not genuine, but it, it really is. You get to a point where you actually just want to make a difference in, in, in what you do. And we're very lucky in that the industry that we're in, we, we are, we're quite sizable in it and we're pioneers. And we feel a responsibility to change the way business is done. We want to change the go-to-market strategies of clients. And we're doing it every day in such exciting ways. We're engaging consumers on a daily level, a daily basis. And, um, yeah, so what, what drives the passion? Making a difference, being responsible, changing people's lives, mentoring, and leaving a legacy. Look, I also think that we found a business coincidentally where we both love what we do. I think we both love marketing, we both love brands, we love go-to-market strategies, um, strategies that, that make brands grow. I think some other things, I think like Gil mentioned, the business has grown and we've got a lot of responsibility and the, big, the business is actually much bigger than Run and Gil. Even though there's a lot of inspiration through our leadership in the business and probably everything that you see coming out of our business, you say, ah, that must have been inspired by Run and Gil. It's actually the business is bigger than us and there's a whole management team in place and there's a whole lot of people whose passion drive the business. I want to go back to one point. You mentioned about opening, if you want to, start, if you want to create wealth, uh, one way to do it is to get into a business or to start a business. So, yes, indeed that's true, but you need to be able to invest either money or to be able to invest in yourself. It's not a sure thing. It's not like you're going to open a business or start a business and, it's, and you're going to succeed. Um, like every investment, there's a risk-return profile. And uh, you may invest of your time and invest of your money and never ever see a return or maybe even see a negative return. Um, yeah, and we, we appreciate because we've done this a few times and we only succeeded to this extent on one, of our, on, on one of our later businesses. We appreciate how much you actually need to invest if you want to have a successful business. And let me tell you that it's not about the glam of entrepreneurialism. Everybody talks about, about, about how glamorous it is to be an entrepreneur and your own boss and you can go on holidays whenever you want. You don't go on holidays because you don't have time because you're so busy doing what you're doing. So yes, th there is something about creating wealth and starting a business, but be careful because there is, it's, it could also be a very quick way to lose your wealth. Can I just extend something that Rand sure. said because I really agree with, with it. But I, I just, you said that the, the reason that people get into business or is to create, to create wealth um, one, one of the reasons. One of the reasons, yeah. Um, I'm not. I think it's almost like it should be in an ideal world. It should be a side reason. It can't be the primary reason. I think the primary reason is because you want to do something amazing that you're passionate about, and if you build it, they will come. Kind of thing. I think it's, it's dangerous to be driven by the financial incentive, even though you kind of know in the back of your mind that if you succeed the money will come. I must say, you know, everyone said, uh, work like you don't need the money. I mean, that's a, it, you listen to that statement and you go, how the hell can you say that? Work like you don't need the money. We only work for money. And the truth is, it's only when we found something that we enjoyed doing so much more than we enjoyed the amount of money we were making that we actually grew the business. And it's because the truth is, it, beca it comes down to chips. It's not about making money. It's about growing, making a bigger business, getting better results for your brands. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And that's what it's that that's what it's about. And what you find is that coincidentally, you also make money when you enjoy it. Great. I think one of the most important things that we spoke about in the beginning, and this this is an important point, Gil. I'm going to maybe come back to to your example earlier on, when I did ask you about in terms of creating wealth, and you said, "Geez, you know, you've got wealth, and the business has been building wealth. Really, if we look at it, maybe your business is your cash cow, and where your biggest reserve sits. You have started to diversify a bit." But in your personal capacity, you haven't really thought, geez, you know, what am I doing in terms of the, the salary that I'm drawing out of the business and maybe the dividends where I'm investing it? Not specifically you. I just, I'm, I'm using it because I think people can relate to it. And that's really why I'm, I'm using you as the example because we discussed it. I'm not pointing a finger to say you need to be doing that. I, I'm personally quite confident that you're probably way ahead of the curve. And I haven't brought that out because I, I want people to be able to re relate to you from a real point of view. To say, geez, here's somebody that's just been working so hard that they, they also – sometimes just don't get a, ch a chance to address 
uh, what needs to be addressed, just because you've got so much on your plate, you actually don't want to address it. You just think, geez, there's so much I've got. And I think that the point I'm trying to highlight is sometimes it's important to make mistakes. And that's really what, the, what uh, from running the point that you made, is when you started your first couple of businesses, you know, probably part of your success has been leading up to the fact that you made so many mistakes. Without making mistakes, you're not going to be able to learn. And I'll, I'll give you a practical example. I took um, friends of mine for a hike this week. Uh, we went on Sunday. And uh, the one son was the first time he was hiking and he wanted to test out his equipment. And he said to me, geez, you know, can I walk with the boots in the water? And I said, you know, today's your tested day. How are you going to know whether you can or can't unless you make a mistake? I said, go wild. I don't care if you do, because it's the only way that you're going to be able to understand if it does or doesn't work. And in society, sometimes they think, geez, let's not make mistakes. And it's common sense. I'm saying to you, the more mistakes you make, the closer you're going to get to making wealth. And I'll end off with this last point, because I know you're also excited and you've got a lot to share. That really, to become an overnight success, sometimes, sometimes takes 25 years. The problem is that you see the overnight success 25 years later after they've gone through all their mistakes. And they still make mistakes. But we'll hear about more about both your points. I know that you've got a lot of questions coming through. We do have quite a few SMSs coming through. Keep them coming. We will address them after the break. If you've got any questions for Gil or Run, the number to SMS me on is 34509. If you'd like to call through and be part of the conversation, we'd also love to hear from you. The number to, to call us on is 0861 24 We'll be right back after this. If you've just tuned in, I'm speaking with Gil Oved and Ran Noena from the, crea the Creative Council Group. And really what they do is they focus on act they, they focus or they are an activation company. And what that means is you could walk into a store, you could see a lady or a gentleman doing a demonstration, would be there on food, soap, whatever it might be. And that's really the, the people, you're, you're, the, you're involved in bringing those people into those the various different organizations to promote quite a few different products. Uh, you've built a great business. You've got a turnover of close to 500 million, uh, which is really exciting. You're employing 650 people. And we've got quite a few SMSs that have actually come through. So let me start with the SMSs. I know that where we left off, one of the questions that we spoke about was making mistakes. And uh, I know that there's a lot for us to discuss because I think we can both discuss mistakes for hours. And the problem is, I think, with mistakes is that you often, after you've made it, you just think that's what I'm throwing in the towel. Because if I just look at the mistake I've done, it's beyond embarrassing. I actually don't know how many wake up tomorrow morning. But somehow you do and somehow you push on. Let's get to the first SMS if you don't mind, and then we'll come back to the mistakes. What would be the key piece? I'm going to take a step back. Excuse me for the listener. This is one of those parts where I'll just be very real. Is During my training, I was taught to keep with one thought. So we're going to stick with the thoughts of the mistake. The SMS is stay tuned. We will come back to you. I'm not going to jump back and forth, even though I have a habit. Sorry that you had to be part of that process, but it was my mistake on air, and now you've got an indication of how sometimes you make a mistake, admit it, backtrack, and hand it back to a guest so that you can forget about it as quickly as possible. Add some ADD to that, then we're, we're history. Um, I want to just correct you in terms of the intro that you said, in terms of what we do, in terms of what the Creative Council Activation does. Okay. So we create brand experiences that drive that branded experiences that drive consumers to transact or to buy a product. So you talk about a lady in store doing a demonstration or maybe giving out a free SOPA. That's one minor thing. It, it falls, forms part of, of a much bigger strategy. I'll give you an example. What most of the listeners probably didn't know is that we own a significant stake in Mr. Delivery. Yeah. And everyone says, so why do you, Mr. Delivery, deliver food to homes? No, we want to be able to get product into consumers' homes or to market into consumers' homes. Right. So what I'm trying to say is we create experiences around brands that will get consumers to buy brands. So yes, at the point of truth or the point of purchase, which we call the moment of truth, we will be quite present. But it's a whole lot of brand experiences. We analyze the psyche of the consumer and we engage them in, mul in multiple points to make sure they buy products. Great. Your biggest mistake. I'm going to give you each one big mistake each. <laughs> okay. So the biggest mistake, um, for, well, for me certainly is, we, th we thought small time. We never thought that our small business would one day be a big business. So we thought small. So instead of hiring the best people, what we said is, oh, look at that person. They're talented. Let's right. grow them with the organization. What we should have done is said, look at the person outside the business who is the best at their field doing right. what they do. Take that person into your business and let them grow your business. And I think if, if I were to go back, I'd spend all the money on people because that's the stuff that's going to come back to bite you. Great. I think... Um Another big mistake was not investing sufficiently upfront in systems and processes and respecting things like admin. Um, uh, entrepreneurs generally are great salespeople. Even if they're not in a sales type of environment, their job is to go seek the business. If you don't right. have revenue, you don't have a business. Right. So that's what they're good at generally. 
uh, they're good at selling a dream. Um, very often they forget that coming with that, you need good finances, you need good admin, good systems, processes, documentation, all those things that are boring that entrepreneurs don't care about, don't want to hear about, but it stunted our growth and it affects us to this very day because of legacy issues. Yeah. We're still catching up because we've been lucky ourselves have always exceeded it, but what I would do differently is invest in it up front right at the beginning. I think you, it's easy to get caught up in your own sales pitch and to ride your waves and to ride your high. And we see many entrepreneurs, even some in our own business, where we've got in our own group with little businesses, where we watch the, the, the entrepreneurs flying and they think, wow, we're on top of the world, nothing can take us down. And then boy, oh boy, that little cloud comes and they're so, 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 so humbled overnight. And those are the things. Don't get caught up in your sales pitch. Make sure that you've got sufficient systems and sufficient infrastructure to back what it is that you're selling, selling yourself. Right. Quick, 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 a quick SMS that's come through. What would be the key piece of advice you would give to someone wanting to make, make it in activations and in the marketing field? Well, oh, um, competitor. If, we, if we told you, we'd have to, well, um, firstly, I think there's, there's a lot of room for good competition. Okay. In, so, so I often say to my clients, and they're quite shocked when I, when I, when I admit this, and I can't believe I'm actually going to admit it on radio, but um, I think we're good. We could be brilliant, we're aiming for it, but we're not there yet. But the problem is that the competition is terrible. Right. So we are our biggest competitor in the market, and we see what we, we should be, where we could be, we're not there yet, but the competitors are weak. The good thing is, in this space, a lot of money is flowing away from the traditional media to this, which is considered non-traditional media. Right. So that's where the focus is. That's where the money is. Uh, brands are looking for real experiences. So guys are going to come in and do it properly. Uh, if they're going to focus on return on investment, on measurability, right. um, and on being quite systems driven, they could create amazing experiences that are creative. And I think they could capture a nice share of the market and hopefully take out those little com competitors that really destroy value in our industry. You know, we always cite one of the reasons for our success. Gil and I have been friends since we were at school, and we've been friends, but we've always competed. I mean, we competed in everything that we did at sports, uh, in matric. Where I know Gil's going to mention that he beat me by 1%, or I know, I know he's going to go down that road. But it wasn't, it was a point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what, but we've but been... But beat him. That's the most important thing. I'm with you, Gil. <laughs> yeah. So we've been best friends, but we've been worst, fiercest competitors since right. the time we were kids. So what, what happened was we created this, cul this culture in our business where my biggest competitor was sitting in a glass office next door to me, and I constantly had to think how it is that I'm going to beat him and how it is that I'm going to turn over more than him. So what we actually created was two businesses yes. that were setting their own standard by competing with themselves. And by the time we looked back, our biggest competitor, which was this huge threat earlier in the game, had fallen so far behind. Sure. And that's one of, one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons for our success. So you ask, what is it that, that if someone wants to penetrate this game, come in and try and up the game. Try and beat us. We encourage you to try and beat us because we've realized that every time we've had a competitor that's tried to beat us, we've become way, way, way better. But there's a big need for the industry to mature right. and to professionalize. Um, we, we can't do it alone. So if guys want to enter the market, we'd be only too happy. Do you ever regret the sacrifices you've made or you've had to make while building your success? Wow. That's <laughs> a deep question. Um, is, Gil, yes. is Gil's mother listening? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes, definitely. Okay. We've, we've sacrificed more than we should have, and it's come at a big cost, yes. We spent our 20s sleeping in the office. when While our mates were out there jolling and building their careers, I found girls sleeping covered by a promotional tablecloth in the office. True story, shivering at 6 a.m. Yes. Well, the heater wasn't working. It was winter. <laughs> yeah. we, we sacrificed relationships because we were, we were married to a business, and any other relationship became secondary. So. I was in Venice on a gondola BBMing. My ex-girlfriend was not impressed. <laughs> She's therefore an ex. <laughs> yeah, so we, we have made sacrifices and we've paid a dear price. There has been a great return. And yeah, How do you evaluate whether the one's worth more than the other? We've had, we've had the time of our lives doing this. So. Great. You know, I, I think what's sometimes also important is to just trust. Uh, you know, one of the most important things is one of the questions we've got, Chase, is what, what about faith? So sometimes you actually understand maybe this is actually the road you're supposed to be on. And there is no right or wrong. You can't turn around and look back and say, geez, you know, we've sacrificed all of this. I think the most important thing is life is a journey. 
And sometimes you have to just turn around and say, we're just on the journey, and where we are is exactly where we're supposed to be. So this concept of sacrificing, to me, is a bit inaccurate, because then you're always saying, geez, you know, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, instead of saying, well, I did exactly what I was supposed to be, because this is where I'm supposed to be right now. And the time wasn't right, or the maturity wasn't right, for you to be in a relationship, because there's no ways that you'd be able to be in a relationship and build the business that you needed to. The business, please God, in many years' time will give you a lot of freedom. That freedom will help you to give back to many people. But you couldn't do that unless you did and what you had to go through now. The more mature you are, you normally find a person that's also in line with you. So I don't think that you've made any mistakes whatsoever. If your mom is listening, I think that uh, she needs to give you a bit of a break. And I think you need to give yourself a break. You are exactly where you need to be. There are no mistakes. Stay tuned. We've got the last five minutes coming up. We'll be right back after this. If you've just tuned in, I'm speaking with Ran Noina and Gil Oved. And they're from the Creative Council Group. We're in the last five minutes. I'm not going to repeat where they're from. It's been a very nice and dynamic show. And uh, we haven't even touched base on maybe even 3% of our, uh, 3% of the topics that we want to discuss. I want to end off quickly going through to politics. Uh, Gil, who's going to be winning the elections? Who do I want or who is... Who's going to be winning the elections? Uh, Obama's going to take it. Yes, who do you want? Romney. Great. <laughs> is that it? That's it. No. Well, uh, we can't go into it because we're limited on time. Okay. And what's important for you to understand is that... Um, sorry about the, the door. But uh, re- really what I, what's important for us to understand from a political point of view is uh, I actually was a big Obama fan. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't want to go into the politics of it, but mm. it will make a very great conversation. Mm. But whether you like or I actually am liking Romney quite a bit. I'm actually yeah. leaning a bit more towards him. I think I would vote for him. I'm with you. It's an Obama Zuma win. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting night. Uh, since 96, I've stayed up every single election night watching it. Good. And uh, tonight's going to be no exception. Good. Right. Uh, Ran, I'm going to end off with you. I want three tips in terms of wealth creation. Um, well, three tips in terms of wealth creation. The first thing is uh, find something that you're passionate about. So don't do something because there's money in it. Find right. something because you really enjoy it and do that. When you are there, think big. Even when you're small, think of what it's going to be like when you're huge. And the third thing, and probably the most important thing, is enjoy the journey. Don't stress about every little thing. I think we made the mistake that we stressed too much. And we should have just enjoyed the journey and enjoyed the ride because the ride is part of the fun. Looking back at it, I probably should have smiled more, should have taken things less seriously. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, those are the three tips that I'd give anyone who's, who's uh, wanting to embark uh, as an entrepreneur to build some personal wealth. Good. I'm going to give you one of my tips. It's easy to say that, but when you're worrying about cash flow, there's a hell of a lot of faith that you have to turn around to be smiling <laughs> every single day. Because the bottom line is when you're trying to figure out cash flow, <laughs> you've got a lot more to try and figure out how the hell do I actually just get through the week or the month instead of turning around. So it's easy to say, I should have. Again, I'm going to come back to the journey. When you're going through that phase, just be real. It's, it's scary, it's nerve-wracking, and this is the most important time when you get to find your creator because your prayers start to fly a lot quicker than they normally would. I could have a lot less gray hairs. <laughs> I agree with you. We've got another two minutes. Give me your tips. I know you're on the spot with that one. We're going to only talk about politics, but your quick two tips. Um, creating wealth, yeah, do what you love and appreciate the people around you. Um, even if they're staff, suppliers, colleagues, clients, eventually they become your friends and they become your confidants and they're the people you spend 70-80% of your life with. So appreciate them, get to know them, understand what they're about and what they need. Um, it will lead to a more successful, enjoyable environment and ultimately a better, more successful business and therefore you'll create wealth that way. I think one of the most important lessons for me uh, as part of that topic and uh, is learning how important people really are. You don't really understand that people, especially if you don't have many assets, are, are really the driving force of your, of your business from so many. They're the face of your business, they're the way they interact with the clients, the excitement comes through. And I think, to me, the most important lesson I learned is that, like you, the hardest critic in my life is probably myself. And there's no mercy. It's quite vicious, and it's a constant. The problem is that I could sometimes bring that forward to my employees and be as critical with them as I am with myself. And what I've learned is how important it is to make people just feel good about themselves because the better they feel about themselves, the more excited they are and the more they actually want to give. So I can turn around and call, look at a person and say, Jesus, you know, like this is pathetic, you're useless, you're this, etc., which is quite vicious. And, and it, I've openly seen that mistake, which is great. And now more, my job is more to try and focus on motivating. Yeah, we've got this philosophy of five times carrot, one time stick. You right. know, talk about carrots and sticks. For every one stick, there's got to be five carrots that you hand out. Great. Uh, it's a great point to end off with, Ren. You've got one. I think our staff may say it's probably five sticks to one carrot, but <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how you like it. I love that view. Great yeah. point way to end off.
For you, the listener, thank you for being part of the journey with me this evening. And with my two guests, I'd like to thank Ran Noina and Gil Oved. You guys are doing great work. What I'm going to be looking forward to really within your careers is that you're both very generous men. And I'm looking forward to seeing the way you give back because it's going to make a huge impact on this community. And uh, I really, again, for any women that are out there that are single, unbelievable <laughs> men, I don't know what, uh, why you are single. And uh, hopefully that uh, we'll be able to find you a nice, uh, good, uh, great, exciting shirach. For you, the listener, thank you again for being part of the journey. Be with you next week. Hang tight. Five more weeks to the end of the year. It's going to be an exciting year next year. We'll be right back after this.